Engineering Counterpoint. Welcome to the show. Jason McPhee, engineer of the state of California, and uh, Philip LaRue, the uh, uh, editor of Minute Dot, uh, a personal finance investment newsletter and a renowned poet. Uh, and I would come up with a nice rhyme, but you're the poet, not me. Uh, the, uh, the program, of course, is on the web at www.accesssacramento.org on YouTube, on Channel 17 in Sacramento, and now on Facebook. So uh, look for us on Facebook. Uh, just type in Libertarian Counterpoint in the search bar on Facebook, and there we are. Um, the big news uh, in the uh, Capitol in Washington, D.C. this week, well, really for the last month or so, has been the Republicans' attempt to get a tax reform bill passed. Uh, and I understand that the uh, NFL doesn't like the tax reform bill. Why in the world would the NFL care? Well, one of the things that they're upset about in it is uh, the idea that uh, Trump is talking about pulling away federal incentives uh, to essentially make the municipal bonds tax-free, I believe. And so this is one of the mechanisms they use to finance a lot of these uh, uh, big stadium projects at public expense. Are you, are you saying that the bill would take away the tax-free status of munis? I think it's, uh, it's at least taking away any, any sort of federal uh, um, incentive that they get on that. So as far as that goes, apparently uh, Brookings did a, a study on this and apparently these incentives are up to about 3.2 billion since 2000 if you count them you know, uh, all in um, uh, together as, as uh, one big incentive on the public trough. So this is one of those things where um, you know Trump is you know actually pushing something I guess it could be pretty good but it's funny how they got there, though, that one of the reasons he got upset about the NFL and, and the tax breaks they're getting is because of the whole flag issue and, so, and the players Thank taking Thank you, Colin Capernaum. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's kind of funny, the path these things take. <laughs> so, well, okay. Now, I mean, it's, it's also interesting to understand the whole uh, thing behind why would a municipal bond have anything to do with financing a stadium? And, of course, the reason for that is that professional sports teams like to say, uh, build us a stadium. So we don't have to pay for it. The team owners don't have to pay for it. Build us a stadium, and we'll, you know, create a boom in business for your uh, downtown area or wherever. Which, of course, economically, never ever happens. Uh, all they're doing is substituting one entertainment dollar for another. They're taking uh, entertainment dollar that goes to pay for Colin Kaepernick and taking it away from somebody, you know, to pay for, you know, a movie theater that's starring Brad Pitt. That's all that's happening, really. Sure. And well, they're talking about um, uh, actually taking away the NFL's tax exempt status. Oh, that and too. That too, and that that is the elephant in the room on that. But that one is. In other words, uh, make them. Uh, I didn't realize the NFL was tax. The exempt. The NFL. Oh, that's uh, you know they are tax exempt, and that has been a huge issue. I mean, you know, much uh, talked about. Uh, that Why? Uh, well, because they are kind of an entertainment. Um, so is Hollywood. Uh, they are. They're the only thing that is allowed to be a monopoly, as a matter of fact. Uh, well, yeah. And so yeah. it was one of those things that was kind of grandfathered in. You know, this is the NFL really kind of started to have its heyday back in the Roosevelt uh, days and uh, 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 Franklin Roosevelt in the 30s and 40s and the. Uh, and he, like, he was a football fan? Is that what I, uh, evidently. Uh, he was a New York fan, and you know, the Giants were pretty good then. <laughs> okay, okay. One of the things, too, to add on to that about the stadiums is NFL stadiums tend to be some of the worst as far as payback to the city because a lot of times these are open-air stadiums, and so they can't be used you know, all week round. And as a matter of fact, NFL games, you're only going to get – eight and maybe some playoff games in those, so just because of the way the home games... So they sit empty, uh, you know, 350 days a year probably. Well, yeah, or at least say they have to scramble harder to find things to fill those with. <laughs> How many Rolling Stones concerts can you have in February? <laughs> there you go, yeah. Uh, the, the tax reform bill as a whole, is there anything... What's the good, the bad, and the ugly in the tax reform bill, Philip? Uh, there, there's a lot of good in it. The one that has sort of flown under the radar a little bit is that it also repeals the individual mandate in Obamacare. That's, that was added on most uh, fairly that, recently. It uh, just snuck in there, and I think that one's flying underneath the radar where people are talking about corporate tax rates. And uh, Will that not uh, pretty much negate or take away the Susan Collins vote and perhaps a couple of others exactly. and, make it, and make it fail in, in the Senate? Well, it, no, is, it, is, it not, is it not the death uh, knell for the, for the bill in the Senate? 
Well, it's going to be really difficult for the Republicans to be sort of outed as Democrats because all of these failed initiatives that the Republicans won on, they are now voting out. It's the Republicans. Well, yeah, but Susan Collins, uh, um, yeah. John McCain, uh, Murkowski from, from Alaska, they all voted against the uh, Obamacare repeal. Repeal. Uh, and, you know, after voting for it many times, I'm sure, uh, while there was no chance of it being signed. Right. Uh, are, are, is, are the Republicans, do they have that much of a death wish that they would actually uh, do it again? Well, it would be, the, the benefits to the Republicans, of course, as they're talking about uh, lowering the corporate tax rate to 20 percent. Uh, they're talking about individual income tax cuts. Uh, they've got, you know, uh, uh, they've got the, the real sticking point which surprisingly the House passed, but the Senate may not, is the elimination of state and local taxes as a federal deduction. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge benefit for New York, California, New Jersey, Illinois, all the bluest of blue states, but there are no Republican senators there. Mm -hmm. So why would the Republican senators be concerned about losing a seat in the Senate mm -hmm. uh, by, by uh, uh, voting against that deduction, which has just passed the House today? Are, uh, as, as of this uh, taping. So oddly enough, where in the House you might have a Republican threatened in California, let's say, uh, to say, hey, I could lose my House seat by voting for this. Well, it's already through the House. Yeah. So now in the Senate you have no seats to lose, and yet the Republican senators are, uh, it, it looks like they're going to block it. Uh, it's either going to be a block or it's going to be a 50-50. And that's why I say there's just no, you know, there's no other way around it that the Republicans are essentially, you know, have been outed as Democrats. <laughs> well, you, you, you know, you know economics, Philip, and, and you know, of course, that uh, with the budget caps essentially uh, thrown to the wayside by the, the Trump uh, uh, deal with, uh, with uh, Schumer, uh, and essentially an unlimited uh, ability to print money to pay for budget deficits going forward, you know, of course, that a tax cut is really a mirage. What we really need are spending cuts, and spending cuts aren't anywhere on the board. Exactly. Well, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that's one of the big problems, too, here is they're talking about this being a, a massive decrease in revenue at the same time Trump wants to increase spending massively on the military. So it's... it's and, 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 leave, the, and leave the social programs alone. And, and the, 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 the thing that yeah. most people don't get that you just nailed is that it is all a mirage. We have the unlimited power to print money. It's just a question now with fiat currency but not backed by any hard asset. It's a gentleman's an international gentleman's agreement as to what currency is worth. Yeah. Uh, and so there's no sense that we're going to have a massive devaluation of the dollar relative to China or Japan, given what they're because doing. Because they're doing exactly the same thing. Exactly. So really taxes, the discussion about taxes is, you know, could be simply put as how much government will allow people to keep of what they earn. And everything related to deficits or, you know, spending versus um, uh, tax revenue is all pretty much a mirage. So uh, when you come down to it, as you correctly pointed out is that the real issue is about cutting spending which means cutting government influence on people's lives and you don't see that anywhere on any table. One thing I was going to comment when you say it's a mirage too though and that's that at least it, it sounds like this tax reform is trying to simplify things sort of so at least maybe it decreases the haziness of the mirage just a little bit. I think they're going from seven uh, brackets to four what they're doing and some other things like that. It's uh, uh, maybe just some simplification, I guess. And it may be, but when they talk about it being revenue neutral, right away you know you're in trouble. Yeah, right because away they're, you know they're you're raising shifting one, deck chairs. Yeah, they're, the they're raising somebody yeah. else's tax to, to lower yeah. you know, somebody else's tax. Yeah. What about the uh, argument that if you uh, do a tax holiday for Apple and uh, uh, Alphabet and the companies who are holding large trillion dollar amounts of cash abroad, not willing to repatriate it, or bring it back to the United States to avoid it being taxed at the 39% or the 35% rate, cutting uh, taxes from 35% to 20%, and also doing a tax holiday for money brought back within a certain time frame. Well, that, Does uh, that make sense? Uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, argument, me. the uh, argument is that, that it's going to be spent on investment, research and development, and so forth. Is that where it's going to be spent, or is it going to be spent on corporate uh, stock buybacks and dividends? Uh, the latter, because uh, you don't, uh, executives think in terms of decades. So to give someone a tax, to give a Cisco or an Apple a tax holiday, 
uh, to repatriate their money. They will sure enough do it, but they are not going to invest in U.S. companies in, in building out uh, infrastructure in the U.S. because they don't have that tax, tax holiday in the following year or the two years out or five years out, whatever the holiday may be. So the most effective way is exactly what Trump proposed initially, which was to go at 15 percent. 20 percent doesn't quite cut it. 20 percent, uh, even uh, the effective tax rate in the U.S. for corporations with all of the incentives is uh, a little less than 16 percent. So if you take away all the incentives and you raise the corporate tax rate to 20 percent, that's what it is. Gone, it's a tax increase. Uh, there are advantages for companies to invest in the U.S. and only a really draconian tax code uh, prevents U.S. companies from building in the U.S. They would take a tax increase, believe it or not, uh, because our cost of energy is so much less. Uh, believe it or not, our cost of labor is, is, is not expensive anymore. Uh, so you have a number of advantages uh, shipping the ports. There are a number of trade advantages for which many countries, including our own, would pay a premium to be in the U.S., but our tax code is so far out, uh, you know, 39 percent, 40 percent, even 50 percent when you start to state and local, um, that that's just, you know, that's just not in the ballpark. And so what they're essentially proposing is a slight tax increase, a simplification of the tax code. Maybe you could make up the cost that way, uh, but otherwise it's essentially paying a little bit of a premium. Well, I mean, and of course, the whole idea of a corporate uh, tax is really a charade. And corporations don't pay taxes, only people do. Mm -hmm. And by people, I mean shareholders, employees, or consumers. Mm -hmm. Those are the people who, who pay corporate income taxes. Corporations collect the tax. Correct. They don't pay them. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, and it's, it's silly to be talking about taxing corporations at all. When it's people that actually well, pay the and when tax. they do the whole revenue, you often see these headlines that you know it's going to cost three hundred billion, or it's going to blow a hole in the budget, or CBO, and all of that. It, it's just simply not true. If you do the math of it, and you uh, allow for a certain amount of incentive, and all of that kind of things, it it all works out. The lowering the tax rate is very likely going to increase tax revenue rather than reduce it. One of the other uh, provisions in the uh, in the uh, Republican tax. Uh, plan is incentives supporting K-12 choice. Tell us about that, uh, Jason. Well, so uh, one of the things I guess the GOP is uh, proposing is to essentially have, uh, like I think it's a 529 plan that they want to have where they allow somebody to uh, invest tax-deferred savings uh, into K-12, through whereas in the past this has only been allowed for college uh, payments. So uh, it's... So you're it's, talking about K-12. through 12. K-12, exactly, private schools, yes, yeah, sorry about that. But this is uh, maybe a, a good thing for school choice in a, in a way because it, it gives one more <clears throat> potential way of people funding uh, school choice uh, in a less costly manner because right now the way it currently is, if you want to go to a, a, a private school, you you lose whatever you've paid into the public system and then you have to go completely pay for it again in, in private. So. Uh, by having this extra incentive, it at least allows you to get a little something back towards it. And with the 529 plan, for people who don't know, it's a college savings plan that works what, like a Roth, meaning you've already paid taxes on the money that you saved, but it can grow tax-free and be withdrawn tax-free if it's for college. The argument against it, and I think I tend to fall down with them on this, is that you know having some experience with working with people like that as a financial advisor is that it really is true that the only people that are putting money in 529 plans are people who can well afford to do it. So the argument is that, that the very people who need the most help with school choice, who need to get their kids out of really poor schools and into better schools, don't have the means to save in a 529 plan for their children. And I think that... Uh, so it would lead actually to more stratification in education? It turns into really another benefit for the, for the people who are already well off and don't need it. When we think about public schools, the whole idea is that it is a sort of flattening of income for the benefit of children. Uh, meaning that you know the poor kids can go to the everybody gets school. to go to a bad school. <laughs> everybody gets to. We <laughs> well, and, and I mean that's the, the, you know the hardcore libertarian argument is you know get the government out of the schooling business altogether, yeah. uh, let education all be private or uh, or home or whatever. 
uh, and uh, going to school of choice, whether it's vouchers or uh, tax credits or whatever method, method that you use, you're still using taxpayer money to pay for uh, kids' education, and it should be paid not by taxpayers but by parents. Well, and, uh, you know, we've always had public education. Not uh, always. Uh, only uh, since, uh, you know, since uh, mid -19th the 19th century. Mid-19th uh, century. Well, I, uh, we, we, that's what we think of as public education. Uh, but what we really mean by public education in that sense is that um, uh, that it was a very large program uh, with all of the pensions and benefits that go to the employees of the system. But since the 1600s, we've had public education in the sense that a community got together and built a college. Uh, Thomas Jefferson built the University of Virginia, you know, so people pooled their money in local uh, using government at the local level to say, okay, we want to do this. We've raised money with a bunch of people. You know, ideally, that's what government is, is sort of a facilitator of that. Uh, and, you know, we've built our school. Uh, we hired our teacher. You know, a hundred people sat in the school room and said, yes, we like that person. They can teach our kids. Well, I, th I think maybe more of the uh, compromise then that comes later for, from a libertarian perspective, I think Milton Friedman sold it pretty well, although he didn't actually, you know, uh, get it all the way out there and acted. But it's the idea that uh, you take government out of the delivery system of education, but not necessarily out of the payment system. And so this is the voucher idea. And so uh, to me, I would see that as being much better than... Uh, so you would call that an incremental step in the right direction, perhaps? Perhaps, but uh, it, it, at the very least, it, it gets it starts to become a market and competition in education. So, and this is one of the worst things about the way it is today is that we just don't have you know all the incentives are wrong because it's government delivering it. There's not uh, you know there, there's not much the, the metrics for success aren't really you know draw, uh, measured by the consumer very well. So it's it's really. You know, we see markets succeed everywhere else, and the idea that we're sort of stagnated on education is, uh, it's, it's really, a, uh, it's a tragedy. Well, okay, so that, which brings up the question, does school choice actually uh, work in public education in terms of providing uh, better results for uh, the uh, students? And uh, I guess you would have to, uh, have to, uh, have to normalize that on a similar student body because, you know, comparing somebody who, you know, lives in uh, one of the richer Washington, D.C. suburbs and goes to a private school compared to somebody that's going to an inner city school in New Orleans, that's not really a fair comparison, a public well, school. And this is one of the big problems we're having nowadays is that for those limited uh, programs that are out there that offer choice, it's, it's hard to measure because the choice is very constrained. Uh, you know, maybe it's a choice to go to a public charter in your neighborhood or, and then the public charter is going to be constrained by a lot of the same union rules and, and other things like that. So, uh, you know, to get it to be much more of a, of a private and public competing against each other and then just see where the best schools are in the end, I think, you know, in the long run that would be the best. You know? Wouldn't it be wonderful if uh, it was uh, to, lim to, to get that hybrid system he just said, look, here's a tax credit per child per year. In California, we spend about $10,000 a year per child to say, okay, you've got two kids, $20,000 tax credit, which is different than, you know, a deduction. You're going to get $20,000. What if you don't pay $20,000? You get $20,000. Oh, so a negative tax. We consider it a common good. A negative good. income tax. We, yeah, we consider it a common good to um, have children educated. So what you're really saying is you're taking from, you are indeed taking from the rich to give to the poor, I suppose, but everybody's going to get that level playing field with their kids. And whether they choose to homeschool, whether they choose independent study, whatever it may be, that you say, this is your working capital to educate your child, you decide how to spend it. Of course, uh, you know, the, the argument against that is that the uh, uh, scammers would say, okay, I'll just pocket the, uh, the money and, and homeschool. And presumably there would be some standard of, achievement or testing. You know, Which brings in the whole regulatory apparatus. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, do you know that the, the biggest thing is the feedback of parents being able to see what happens to the alumni of certain schools after, a, you know, it may take a few years to really get going, but after about a decade or so, you're going to start to see that some schools 
don't have a very good track record for their alumni, and some do. And the schools that do have a, a good track record are going to, people are going to emulate them. That's what competition's all about. And they'll tend to get more customers, and meaning parents. Well, I think the bottom line is that monopolies don't provide very good uh, service, yeah. monopolies or duopolies. And the public education system at the uh, L high level is a monopoly mm -hmm. uh, for, for all intents and purposes. Uh, and as a monopoly, the uh, the inmates run the asylum, the, the, the teachers' unions, the teachers, the uh, administrators, in particular the administrators, uh, do very, very well. They, they go into the education business to do good, and they do very well. Uh, and they get great pensions, which are not, on, which are, you know, they may get surprised at how well they are funded going forward. But they, you know, right now it looks like they're doing, they've got a pretty sweet deal. They work, you know, nine months out of the year, get good uh, salaries while they're working, uh, don't have to work that many hours per week, certainly per year. And at the end of their uh, however many years they stay in the education system, they get a sweet pension. So you have a, you have a system where the where it serves the educators and the administrators and i want to emphasize administrators because i think it's over 50 percent of the money spent on, on uh, elementary high school education is spent not on teachers but on people in the front office they do very well but, well and we've but got the, this the kids thing now, don't. right underneath all of that why none of, and no reform could ever work is that we are now at a place where you have as many retired work for, uh, in the workforce, just in general in civil service, including the teachers. So you have people with salaries for life. And that's trying, you know, it's trying to be, they try to mask it over, but the fact is, is so much more is going, so much of our present dollar is going to people who no longer work. But you still have to fund the people who work. The pensions. The pe well, you still have to pensions pay them a salary. Yeah. And so what's happening is we have a workforce that does no work that is the size, meaning they're retired, that is the size of our present workforce. And so, and that's true whether you want to talk about CalPERS or CalSTRS or what have you, and that's the hidden rot that nobody wants to talk about because who's going to tell a teacher, you know, former teacher at 75 that, you know... Hey, uh, your pension is no good anymore. You know, or it's cut in half. Yeah. And so as long as that contract exists, there's just simply not enough money in the world because everybody's living longer, uh, there aren't enough tax dollars. Living longer, more. retiring earlier. Uh, you know, they probably back that up a little bit, but, but the point is you can't have somebody in a 40-year career of retirement and pay them top dollar. You know, many of them retired with 90% of final salary. Uh, you put in, you know, say if you're 60, you know, and you worked for 35 years, chances are you're pretty much there. So we have a salary, we have an entire uh, payroll system of retired people that's equal to the one that's, that's now one to one. Yeah. And as long as that exists, uh, there's simply no reform possible, no tax credit for, you know, no, there's no budget <coughs> reform possible with the active teachers. Well, but you know, and, and, and to even be able to address that, you have to have people thinking skeptically about the system in the first place. And if everybody's a product of the same system, you're very much like less likely to be skeptical of that system. Mm -hmm. And the the market would price. Uh, you know, I'm all for uh, a teacher making you know a hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, said ben, pe uh, benefits, uh, health care, four hundred one k, all of that. But it has to cut off when they stop working. You know, they need to have the same responsibility to save for their retirement that the private sector has. Oh, try to sell that. <laughs> and, and, but without <laughs> that, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, without yeah. that, we're in trouble. Well, we have, uh, this is a kind of changing years here. Uh, Donald Trump got in trouble for throwing uh, uh, stuff, uh, food to Koi in Japan. Is that, is that, what, what's that all about? Uh, it, it really, it's an example of... Um, when you have partisan reporting that is no longer related to journalism. So the upshot of the story is that, uh, you know, this piece of the thing shows Koi just dumping fish, all this fish, fish food, food into a pot. Yeah. And it looks like the ugly American. Uh, well, it turns out, and so they just kept showing that, here's the big ugly American, you know, instead of delicately feeding the fish, throws all the, you know, and it, you know our, here we go again. But the upshot of it was that Trump was just emulating what uh, Abe had done. And so Abe, the prime minister, Japan's prime minister, had you know, fed a little and then dumped all his in, so Trump did exactly the same thing. Well, the news cut off the part where, where Abe did that. And so it looked like the ugly American when Trump was just going along with whatever Abe was doing. And that was done intentionally. 
uh, by the media to say, hey, we want to cut off, you know, we just want to just, that's all we're trying to do here is make Trump look bad. Well, and the sad thing is, too, I mean, this plays right back into the fake news narrative because it was CNN and it was a CNN video. <laughs> and essentially, I mean, you, you see it when you go to uh, look at the video online that, you know, they're, they're taking a larger frame and when they get to him throwing the food, they essentially zoom in to him. So they've got the whole picture, but they've edited it down to where you're only seeing him throw it in. So they maliciously essentially exactly. have, have uh, uh, altered their view. And, and when they're supposed to be purveyors of the truth, that's, you know, that's the really serious issue. It's not even so much the little... But is it anything new? CNN is Democrat uh, and uh, Fox is Republican and uh, most of the rest of the media is also Democrat. But if you go back to colonial times, the uh, newspapers back then were very highly partisan, uh, and uh, perhaps even more so than they are today. Uh, is there anything wrong with the partisan media? That's a great question. I, I was reminded that Jefferson set up a newspaper uh, and funded a newspaper uh, specifically to uh, write articles about Adams in the 1800s. <laughs> yeah, it's a true story. Uh, and so that has always been true. Uh, and I think that perhaps we're nostalgic for something like a golden age of the Cronkites, uh, the Huntleys and Brinkleys. And where Cronkite was, had his own biases, and so did Dan Rather. I mean, you know, there was no golden age. Well, when you get it to Rather, perhaps. <laughs> but, uh, and it may be. And it may be that it's just a, a sort of a, a wish that we did have that kind of journalism. Well, I, I think the bigger, because, you know, obviously we, we all understand that people have biases. That means people who run companies have biases. But the big issue is when people believe that they're getting something from an unbiased source. And I think, you know, entities like CNN try to purvey themselves or try to portray themselves as purveyors of truth. Not that they're biased. With the images. fragmentation of media that we're seeing now, I mean, sure. ABC, NBC, CBS used to be 90% of the, of the television news. Now it's way less than that because of cable news uh, networks and, uh, and, and internet uh, uh, news networks. Uh, are we becoming more fragmented as, uh, uh, you know, uh, more tribal in, in our news consumption? I wonder how much news consumption there is at all anymore. Uh, just speaking, you know, uh, you know, if you want to, uh, anecdotally, uh, how many people, the majority of people will say that, you know, they just really don't watch any of that anymore. Watch the Libertarian Counterpoint. We'll tell it to you straight. And uh, we'll be back again next week, same time, same place, www.accesssacramento.org, on the web. Uh, at, uh, that's where we are on the web, on uh, TV at Channel 17 in Sacramento, and of course on YouTube, and now on Facebook. Thank you very much for being part of the show.